Uh, Father, we come to you again in thanks to worship and to learn more about you. We'd ask that you be with those who were mentioned here this morning and also those who were not mentioned and be with the, uh, the students and the teachers and uh, all our uh, servicemen and be with those who have been affected by all the uh, wildfires. We'd ask that you continue to bless us, watch over and guide us, and trust them we pray. Amen.
Remember? Okay. M's are for the guys, they stand up. F's are for the girls, they stand up. And here's what we're going to do this week, remember? We're going to have group participation here, so tell everybody to get on the edge of their seats. Go ahead and tell them. So get on the edge of your seats, and here we go. And so when we get an M word, I will make so the guys will pop up. And you better pop back down quick. Don't pop up too fast, we're gonna pop everything. <laughs> so I will make you fishers of fishers of men. So girls on the F's, guys on the M's. We're gonna start like this, ready? Everybody kind of bend down, Jason, bend down a little bit. Because we gotta pop up when it's time. Here we are, ready? I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Very good, here we go. If you Congratulations on winning the lottery. <laughs> We're talking about love today uh, and uh, the definitions that we have with it. Are very, this is one of those other big verses in the book of 1 John. I talked to Mary earlier uh, on the way here. 1 John is such a great book because there are scriptures in it, passages that you got to know in your heart and that are super encouraging. The one on the screen, this is how we know what love is. <laughs> that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. The one in 1 John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and give us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, even uh, the one from a couple weeks ago. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Great verses. You need to put your heart, put them in your heart. You need to know these verses. And this week's is also the same as it talks about love. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, and John talks about love 46 times the word shows up within this small book of five chapters. In fact, in these 15 verses uh, that we're going to read, which is just a part of that this morning, in 15 verses here in chapter 4, the word love is used 27 times. You do the math. Find out how important it is that John is talking about this. And, and so that's why when we come to our verse today, I also want to give a little bit of warning. Be careful with just one verse. It is important to put those verses in your heart. But understand that you, the verses that we know and memorize and the verses that we quote and sometimes are quoted against us all have to put in context. We live in a world where we think communication is all about being quick so we don't waste another people's time. We send an emoji out or we send a meme out hoping that it uh, gives uh, the idea that we want to get across. And, and honestly, we're pretty poor at saying what we mean. 
Twitter even limits the number of characters that we have. Books are less read more and more. Misunderstanding is at an all-time high. And not just in my house <laughs> either. And so the importance of the scripture that we're going to look at today is that there is context with this verse. Context, con, with the text. What is surrounding the text? What scriptures go with it? How does the author use this phrase? Uh, what point is he trying to get across? Uh, what discussions come from the way that he and other people use these words? And so our, our verse today, 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 7 uh, and following, uh, is a great verse in this study. It's an amazing verse, and it provides a lots of contemplation. The key phrase that we're going to talk about today is very simple. God is love. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Uh, but is it God is love? Is it God is love? Is it God is love? I mean, there's a lot to put with it in the understanding of what he is trying to get across when he says it. With that, let's read the full uh, passage surrounding it. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through verse 12. It says this. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that he might live, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. What a great passage. An understanding of who God is and who we are and the way that we want to live around. We need, oh, we need the two important things that Jesus says. We need to love God, and we need to love one another. It's very basic. It's a very simple principle of being a Christian. Um, but what does it mean, and how does it come into play with that? Now, I could give an opportunity for any one of you to come up on stage and tell us what you think it means when it says things like, God is love. But you know as well as I do that there's a lot of crazy ideas out there. And it wouldn't take long, maybe, before we would get into the opportunity of really twisting the words and the meaning uh, that is found there. You can't, um, it, uh, you can't interchange those words. It's not a verb that you can put the one before the other. Love is not God, nor is God bound to your understanding of love. And so what I want to begin with is that when we read Scripture is to know that Scripture will show us what it means. The Bible is the only book that you can study, but also studies you. So we don't want to read in the Scripture. We need to look to Scripture and within Scripture so that it reveals itself. The whole book then as we consider what, how John uses this word, God is love. That helps give us a more complete picture. In 1 John chapter 1, he says, God is light. And there are those people who would say, God is love and twist it to manipulate their own understanding. And they wouldn't do the same with the way that he says, God is light, <laughs> just with the way that the phrase is set up. And even a little later it says, God is spirit. John chapter 4, uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, when Jesus is talking about uh, with the Samaritan woman, love describes the quality of God's character, is the point that John is trying to get across here. So all of God's activity is a loving activity. If God creates, he creates in love. If God rules... He rules in love. If he judges, he judges in love. Even in his condemnation, all that God does is an expression of his nature, and that is love. What does it mean when we say that God is love? I think it's also sometimes important to understand what it doesn't say. And I want to spend a few moments just talking about that. The Bible doesn't say that love is God. That's a deception from the devil. The devil counterfeits the things that God gives. He twists and he perverts the message that God has. Love is not the supreme good in your life. Love is not to be worshipped. Love is not to be our goal. Love is not to be in a position of authority in your life. You don't live to please love, nor should you let love define you. God has already given you. As his child. Love is not God. 
as I wrote that, I considered also, maybe it's not so important how well you are loved by other people in this life. Maybe it's not so important if you will ever find the true love from a world standard. The point from the passage is that in this life, you are not to try to find love from another person, but you're to understand what love is from your Heavenly Father. And we don't worship love. We worship Him instead. The passage also doesn't say that God is tolerant. God is love doesn't mean that God is tolerant. That's a nice easy word, buzzword for the day, right? Because God is not tolerant. God gives rules. God gives standards. God gives punishment. And when those standards are not, when those standards are not met, there is expectation with them. I've said it several times, and you know, the second death is just as real as the first. Hell is certain for those who are outside of the promises of God. Favorite sermon ever, if you ever need one, you need an outline to go with. Here it is. Sin is sin, hell is hot, and forever is a long, long time. Those things are real because God is not tolerant. To say that God is love doesn't mean that God just doesn't pay attention to what goes on in our world. No, God responds to sin. Your sin is a big deal to God. Heaven is not going to be overcrowded. Sometimes we think, whoa, uh, I wonder who's going to be there. And I've shared several times before the scariest verse in the Bible, Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus tells us. Yikes. Love, God is love doesn't mean that God is tolerant. And it doesn't mean that there's a second heaven for the wealthy, corrupt people or the sexually perverse people. Well, there's a real heaven, and then there's a second heaven. Some people want to, I have the idea of, well, if you're not quite good enough to make the A student, surely there's a B student heaven. That's not what this says. God is love does not say that, and that's not true. There's still hell to pay if you pervert the gospel even just a little bit. Sex outside of biblical marriage is sin. Lying is sin. Gossip is sin. Jealousy is sin. Boy, we're in trouble, uh, just to put it in that way. And that's the point. There isn't a second chance to do better next time. God is love does not mean that God will excuse your sin. Your sin must be dealt with. And that's what Jesus is all about. Who would attempt to talk God into finding another way for us to find eternal life when he has made such an amazing sacrifice for us? God's love is precious. Don't attempt to cheapen it. God's love also does not say that God changes his mind because we're so advanced in our culture. I know uh, we're so smart that we have electricity and now we want to drive cars with batteries uh, that may even be more detrimental uh, than the way that we've done things for a while. But we're not sure. But we think we've really accomplished something. So some people want to believe that as culture changes, so does God and God's definition of love. Well, we used to think homosexuality was wrong. Well, we're so smart now. No. We used to think selfishness is wrong. But then we started earning money and started setting things up for our retirement. No. God doesn't change. The Bible reminds us, Hebrews chapter 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Micah chapter 6 says it very plainly. God is telling his people, I am the Lord and I do not change. God doesn't change his mind about what love is. His definition of love has been consistent from the beginning all the way through until the end. God is love. is an important concept for us to know. One last thing that it doesn't say. God is love does not say that sin is ignored and that judgment is no longer needed. Some people want to believe that God is going to give everyone a passing grade. That he's going to look down on us and see our patheticness and say, we're really going to have to curve uh, this grade just to make sure that everyone passes so that everyone can go on to the next place. That's not what God is love tells us. We want to hope that God really isn't bothered by my sin as much as the preacher, as much as the Bible says he is. We want to claim freedom and grace, but such claim cheapens God's love. Again and again, John and the writers emphasize that obedience matters to God when we hear the phrase, 
God is love. God's love must be understood with the boundaries of sin and judgment. That's the point of his love through Jesus. That's the, how the arrest of the passage ties into the understanding of what it means to say that God is love. Back to the scripture. Your friends love love one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how, he says, God showed his, his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, he continues. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice that big word propitiation in some of your translations that we've talked about weeks ago. He sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we ought to love one another. God is love puts all of those things in the understanding of atonement and, and sanctification. Uh, it's a reminder that God's love is shown in spite of our disobedience and rebellion, that God has provided a way for us to get back right with him. And it's not waving a magical wand. It cost God a lot in sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins. God wouldn't have shown love for us if Jesus hadn't died for our sins. Sin and our choice to participate in that rebellion demonstrates the magnitude of God's love. You see, in some ways, love comes with agency. The choice of free will makes love necessary. And that's why John so quickly ties the love back to the sacrifice of Jesus. You can't understand God is love without the rest of the story of knowing who Jesus is and the gospel message that God sent Jesus to take care of our sins so that we can be in that right relationship. Would you love your child if you didn't make sacrifice for them? Would it be called love? That's what the long hours, the long nights are about. That's what the money <laughs> is spent for. That's what the effort of discipline uh, is all about. That's what the work is for. That's what school clothes is. And reading books on hours upon hours, all of those things are a sacrifice for our child to show them that we love them. In Jesus, God's love says, I do this for you. What would heaven be like without Jesus' sacrifice? We would all think that we deserve to be there. Will there be some people in heaven who will complain about the amenities of heaven as if they're God? No. Those people will not be present. You are present only if you accept the love of God through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. This is love, God says. This is how God is love, through the person of Jesus Christ. The next verse there, if you have your Bible still open, verse 11. Uh, is now the part of the scripture that I, I want to be the meat of the passage. That was all just introduction <laughs> to help us get to this point uh, today. Uh, verse 11 is one that I think also stands alone in our hearts. It says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, you can put that then in the other idea of context. So many times we talk about loving other people. It means a little bit more when you help define God's love for us through Jesus. It means a little bit more when you put together God's relationship to us. When he then turns to us and says, because I loved you, you ought to love others. It's the message that we know from the beginning, that we've heard since we had brothers and sisters or grew up and went to Sunday school class, that the world has other people in it, and as long as it does, we ought to love them because God loves us us. In fact, if you have your scriptures still open, that's kind of highlighted even earlier in verse 9. It says this, this is how God shows his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Maybe your translation reads it a little bit differently. Uh, one of them says it this way, by this the love of God is revealed in us that God has sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. So what he's saying is, the way that the world is going to know God is love is from you. God's love is revealed to the world in the way that you love other people. 
There's a lot of Christians who just want to receive. Oh, oh, Jesus, give me your grace. Oh, Jesus, give me your forgiveness. Oh, Jesus, help me feel good about myself. Oh, Jesus, help me in my struggles. And God is there for that. But it doesn't stop with you. God's purpose in calling you his child is that as he loves you, it then goes out to other people. It makes a difference in the lives of those who you live with around us. Love comes from God, but it's transferred from God through us to other. Very simply, love comes from God. Love comes to us through Jesus Christ. And in the Holy Spirit goes out to other people. We made reference a few weeks ago how all of those connections have to come into place. When there's a wire short in one of them, God's love then can be easily misconstrued. But God's love comes from him through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit out from us to the rest of the world. Many people get so far and then forget that Christianity is about loving other believers. In fact, that's what John writes this scripture about if we were to put all of the weeks together. We talked a few weeks ago about testing the spirits. There were those people in the church who said they were Christians, who said they knew Jesus, who said they worshiped Jesus, and did nothing to help their fellow brethren, and did nothing to participate in the lives of sharing the gospel or taking care of the needs of other people. It's one thing to claim Christianity. It's another one to show it by what you do, by the way that you spend your money, by the way that you use your time. Is God's love seen through you? Because God loves us, we also ought to love other people. The love of God does not reach perfection until it finds objects of love beyond itself, one Bible scholar said. And when it does, God, whom no one has seen, becomes visible in that manifestation of love. Another one said it this way, God's love for us is perfected only when it is reproduced in us or, as it may mean, among us in Christian fellowship. And finally, another says, the love of God displayed in his people is the strongest apologetic that God has in the world. How is the world going to know about Jesus? From you. Because God loves us also ought to love one another. And I know maybe you're like, preacher, you don't get it. You don't know the people that I know. Yeah, I know. I know others. <laughs> I've been there. And sometimes we hear these words and we're like, Jesus, we can't do it. It's impossible for me to love other people like you loved me. And when you think about it, it seems preposterous for God to even to put that constraint on our relationship. How am I supposed to love? There's no way I can do it. And that's exactly what Jesus was telling us when he told us in John chapter 15, without me, you can do nothing. You can't love people by yourself. It's impossible. You don't have the strength or the time or the patience or the compassion or the love of enough. Uh, to do it just from within what you have in yourself, you can't do it without the power that comes through the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. You want to know what it means to love other people? It's relying on that and letting that show through you so that you can love others. It's about the submission to God's will and letting him make the choices in your life. Dr. Gordon Feed successfully points out that that's what it means as John makes this reference to being in Christ. He says that it's Christ who lives in me. Most likely it's a kind of shorthand for Christ by his spirit lives in me. We are to be like Christ. In fact, if you have your Bible still open, there are several little part, uh, phrases here that are part of the scripture that we've read. Uh, that help us understand that the cause of love, that the way that we can love other people is to rely on God. It is God who is the cause of all of our life. And verse 6, uh, it makes reference uh, just at the beginning of the verses, or excuse me, uh, at the, the last sentence. This is how. There's a cause 
clause uh, here in this passage. If you want to know how this happens, this is how. It's because God lives in you. It says it also again in verse 9. This is how. The reason that you can do this is because God has already shown this for you. In verse 14, it comes up again. Uh, and we've seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior. To, oh, that's not verse 14. It's also there in verse 17. In this way, that little clause as it sets up may be like, there's no way that I can love other people. But God is trying to say, you can, because I want to enable you to love them. God's love is personal. It's tangible. And it must be lived and experienced. One final story I want to end with. The daughter of the founder of the Salvation Army was out doing the work, the hard work of loving people. She was cleaning the sores of a very sick person, uh, doing some of the stuff that most people wouldn't do. And, and when this person walked up, watching her clean these sores of this other person, this person says, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. To which the young lady also said, neither would I. John writes, if we love one another, God's re love remains in us and is made perfect in us. There are things that we wouldn't do for all the money in the world. But God's love is worth more than all the money in the world. What it means to love other people is put in perspective when we consider what God's love has done for us. It's a simple passage. God is love. Beloved, let's love one another. But love comes from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. How are you at loving? I'm probably like a lot of you. I need help. There's a lot of times that people just take me to the end. Uh, 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 and it's hard when you look at the world around us and you, the decisions that people make and uh, the frustration that you get. And, uh, you're like, oh, this is just going crazy. How in the world are people so ridiculously foolish? Uh, and it becomes hard to want to extend love to them. And if I left it on my own, I wouldn't. But God says, ah, I love you, so you probably need to love them. That's kind of how this works. And that's how my love is going to be made complete. Not because Jesus is going to come back and do miracles on this earth. Not because Jesus is going to open up a hospital and take care of everybody needs. And not because Jesus is going to do something miraculous uh, and make everybody happy and wealthy uh, and, and comfortable. The way that God's love is seen is by you and me giving our time to other people. People that we may not want to. But the opportunity that God continues to put in front of us every day. He asks us again and again, show them love so that I can show them my love for them as well. We come to a time in our service to say, okay, God, good. Thanks for that. <laughs> okay, God, I uh, really need to remind it of the way that I treat other people around us. But at the same time, I hope that it helps us to reflect. Help us, hopes it help us to reflect in worship the importance of loving God. God loves you, and he's done so much more for you than just give you a free pass to go to heaven. God provides for you his promises of strength for the day, his presence in your life. We have nothing to worry about on this side of heaven. And on the other side of heaven, he's already taking care of those things, too. It's about us being willing to submit. It's hard to submit. But it's right to submit to the Lord God because he loves us. If you need to respond to the Lord today, we invite you to do so. Our hymn of decision is number five, excuse me, 638. Uh, we're going to sing, I need thee every hour. And if you need to make a difference, uh, you need to respond and let God make a difference in your life. We yeah, invite you to do as we do every Sunday. Come forward. Let us pray with you. I know that life is hard. I know that life is not easy. I know that living as a Christian in the way that God calls us to can be very, very trying. I get it. But we're in this together. Let us walk along with you. Let us talk with you through the difficult times that you have. 
give us giving one another encouragement as we live the life the love that God has called us. If you need to respond to the Lord today, we're going to sing 638 beneath the area. Please stand.
because God first loved us. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray. 